Dr. Howard Krein, and it gives me a great pleasure to introduce him. I just want to, you can read about his bio in the, uh, uh, in the uh, uh, outline, but I wanted to say just a, a couple of other things that aren't in a bio. Uh, Howard, I've known since he was a resident, so we go back a long, long ways, and he's a, a, a great colleague and a dear friend, and um, you know, I, I showed you Will's Eye Hospital, but uh, Will's Eye is the ophthalmology department for Jefferson uh, University Hospital, which is the level one big university hospital in the center city. And um, I work very closely with two departments there, with uh, otolaryngology, ENT, and neurosurgery. And over the years, Howard and his colleagues have been instrumental in building really a world-class department. I mean, this is a place where you just can't do any better. And he's been a real linchpin in developing a program, took a long time, where we have had lots of patients with very bad head and neck cancers that were in the past deemed uh, just not operable, inoperable, and uh, we would just leave them be. And now with techniques that Howard and his colleagues have developed, we can take these patients to the OR it takes 12 or 18 hours, but we can resect it and Howard reconstructs them. And that's not an easy feat. Uh, so uh, it's uh, a great pleasure to work with them. And I always tell the fellows, you met Dr. Lyle this morning, the first time they go to work over at Jefferson with the, the ENT team, I always tell them, just, just watch Dr. Krein's hands because there are surgeons and there are surgeons. And when you watch a facile, gifted surgeon, it's like, it's like watching a concert pianist. No, no motion is wasted. It's very smooth. It's beautiful to watch. And that's what Howard has. As uh, Dr. Billick um, mentions, um, you know, today's been uh, a lot of great information on um, a lot of the facial dystonias, but with the concentration on all the upper face. Um, we're going to now move into a little bit of the lower face and cervical dystonias, right? The lower face and neck dystonias. Um, I just wanted to introduce myself. He already gave me, you know, the same introduction maybe my mother would have given, so I appreciate that. <laughs> um, I'm locally grown, born and raised in Philadelphia, grew up in Jersey. Um, I did a PhD in neuroscience, so this topic is near and dear to my heart. Um, I did it up in uh, at UMDNJ in Jersey because I'm a Jersey guy. Uh, then I moved down, came down to Philadelphia where I did my MD. I specialized um, in residency in head and neck surgery. So otolaryngology, which is ENT, um, a lot of people think just is like ears and boogies, but it, it gets real, um, it gets very interesting and very in depth. We become experts in literally just the head and neck region. And believe it or not, it, I mean, it can take a lifetime to really um, learn the intricacies of that area. Um, fell in love with facial plastics and reconstructive surgery, and so I actually have on here VCU, and I was thinking, nobody's going to know where VCU is. Dr. Berman, you know, uh, helped me, uh, helped me, uh, or put the picture up, so hopefully now all of you know VCU is, uh, is a Virginia Commonwealth University down in Richmond, so that's where I did my fellowship, and then came back up here, and as Dr. Billick said, um, have uh, built... Uh, along with my, uh, with my partners, um, the facial plastics and reconstructive surgical division of the ENT department and where we do microvascular surgery. We have a facial nerve center um, and we have a center for facial aesthetics. The interesting part about all of that, the microvascular, the facial nerve and the aesthetics all really work together to, I think, give the best outcomes for all these kinds of things. Because it's not just about knowing how to do a reconstruction. Reconstructions aren't any good unless people can go out in public and look and act normal, whether it's going to dinner, eating, or just talking to somebody. So um, just to go back and refresh everybody, right? There's a lot of, of anatomy in the head and neck region. The, the things I want to talk about as we go into lower facial um, dystonias is, right, there's really um, subsets of muscles. And so we have the muscles of facial expression, and then what I'll talk about also is muscles of mastication. The muscles of facial expression, and there is a whole host of them, 
are all controlled by the same cranial nerve. It's cranial nerve seven. And if you look at the, and I think there's a, maybe I can use this as a pointer, but you can see it ri literally any expression that you make when you smile, when you cry, when you frown, when you look curious, all of those are done by these small muscles all around our face, our head and neck region. So you have the frontalis, the procerus, the corrugators. Uh, I'm not gonna name them all, but the important thing is these are all smaller muscles and all controlled by the same nerve. Um, the cranial nerve seven, which we talked about, it actually spreads out almost like a hand comes out of the skull base, wraps around, goes through your parotid gland, which is on the side of the face, and then innervates all these muscles in a, in a, in a very interesting um, pattern. There's some redundancy, but not a lot. We have an upper division and a lower division, and then a sort of meshing of the upper and the lower division for the mid face. Um, and so we know that if you lose the upper division or something happens with the upper division, you're not going to be able to raise your eyebrow. You're, you might get an ectropia on where your eyelid um, hangs, or you won't be able to blink. Um, the interesting part about that is we also have the other subset of muscles, which is the muscles of mastication. These are deeper and bigger muscles. So the main muscles of mastication, which are all innervated by the, by the trigeminal system, are uh, the temporalis, the um, medial pterygoids, the lateral pterygoids, uh, and the masseter muscle. So subset, different subset of muscles. And these are the muscles that are more involved, not only, but more involved in a lot of these dystonias. Why is that important? They're deeper, they're harder to hit with Botox for treatments. It really becomes an art to try to get into these deeper muscles, especially when um, we have some of the um, the, uh, the, the lower um, jaw thrusting and, um, and, uh, and writhing. So, you've been, listen, most of you are probably um, know more about dystonias than I do because a lot of you live with this. Um, but <clears throat> just a general overview, right? It's a highly variable neurologic movement disorder. It's characterized by involuntary movements. And this is the important part that are patterned and repetitive. You've heard all day, and I know most of you know already, the exact cause is not known yet, um, but it may involve the interaction or an alteration in several brain regions. Now, when I did my PhD, um, I actually did my whole PhD on somatosensory integration. So what that means is, how, do you, how did your body know, and if you, if you can imagine how complicated it must be, that if I drop something and I want to go pick it up or I hear a glass fall and I go to clean it up, think about the intricacies of what the brain has to do to actually turn your attention to something and then, then actually take all the feedback from where you are, how you're standing, the proprioception, integrate that into your brain and then tell your body how to move to smoothly and accurately accomplish the task of either picking something up, cleaning something up. Well, we know that a lot of that occurs in the basal ganglia and the surrounding structures. Some of it goes up to the premotor cortex, the cerebellum, the thalamus, but the majority of it is happening within this system called the basal ganglia system. We'll talk a little bit more about that um, when we touch on the deep brain stimulation. But there's two main hypotheses about these dystonias, right? Some of them uh, some people are saying, well, some of it is a sensory input um, contribution, and some of it is a motor output contribution. And in reality, it's probably a little of both. But the hypothesis or the hypothetical, um, uh, the hypothetical um, uh, understanding of this is that if we can, if we do a high vibratory stimulation into a certain muscle we can actually cause it to become dystonic. So we know some, there, there's got to be some kind of a, a contribution from the stimulation coming in. We also know that if we block that muscle, if we put uh, lidocaine into it and make it so it doesn't feel, that contribution we, goes away and we can't make this muscle into a dystonic, uh, have a dystonic reaction. So we know that there is some kind of input 
that is contributing to the dystonias. <clears throat> the, the main hypothesis, though, is there's some kind of, of abnorm, abnorm, ah, abna, ab, abnormal, couldn't get that word out, abnormal, that was abnormal, uh, some abnormal contribution of how the different areas in the basal ganglia in the brain are communicating with each other, right? And I always tell people that it, if, you, if you imagine that it's, it's just these, let's say, five specific areas in the brain, and they're all interconnected, and there's this just this smooth flow and transition and transfer of information between these areas, all of a sudden, if you get an in interruption in the way these signals are going back and forth, that's why the dystonia starts to happen. <clears throat> So, dystonias can be congenital, acquired, or idiopathic, as you know. Congenital, you're born with it, acquired. There might be something else, stroke, brain tumor, some other, um, some other abnormality that's causing the dystonia, or it can be idiopathic. It can develop spontaneously by itself. Um, classified by three main factors, age of onset, the area of the body that's affected, and the underlying cause, right? So, there's Childhood onset, which is 0 to 12 years old, adolescent, 13 to 20, and adult onset. <clears throat> for what we're talking about today, very, very rare for children and adolescents to have um, the lower facial or cervical dystonias. So everything that we're talking about is really about the adult onset. Um, focal uh, or segmental, it just depends on where it is, it is part of the way we characterize it. Um, for what we're talking about, it's all focal. And then again, we talked about the cause, whether it's uh, idiopathic, symptomatic, or secondary, or, um, or uh, hereditary. So how are they diagnosed? Unfortunately, there is no validated criteria to diagnose these, right? Which means there's no specific laboratory or imaging study. So it's a clinical diagnosis, which is based on history and physical. Now, that doesn't mean somebody comes in, they tell you they have it, that you do your quick, your quick physical, and you say, oh, it's, it's a dystonia. You have to still rule out that there's something else going on. So we must rule out other motor and neurological issues. But once that's done, it becomes a, almost a diagnosis of exclusion. The problem is, um, and as patients, you guys know this, that delays the, the diagnosis and very often the treatment. And people spend years sometimes going from doctor to doctor to try to figure out what's going on with no real help. And uh, I think that's the real shame of um, the way um, the, you, know, you guys as patients sometimes uh, end up getting caught in these, in these, uh, in these system. So I'm gonna try to bridge um, what we talked about earlier, which is upper face, right, the blepharospasm portion with um, the lower face. Um, uh, Mage syndrome is the way to do, to, do that. It's also uh, known as Bruegel syndrome. Why is that the, the way to combine this? Because it's a combination of the blepharospasm, the upper face, and the lower face in oromandibular dystonia. First described in the 1900s, interestingly, two to one women to men. So it's more common in women and it has a varied age of onset, very varied, literally 40 years. So um, people are, are sometimes diagnosed in their 30s, sometimes newly diagnosed in their 70s and 80s. First symptoms is re are really very subtle, and again, this is why we talk about sometimes there's a delay in diagnosis. Um, it just becomes like an increased, increased um, rate of blinking sometimes. And I think we've all seen people, and it doesn't, some people get nervous and blink a lot. So it, some people will get diagnosed with anxiety, and it was early onset MAGE syndrome. So um, anyway, increased rate of blinking, which generally um, then um, moves on to uncontrollable squinting, sometimes eye closing. Um, you get light sensitivity squinting um, of the eyes and closing of the eyes during speech, which is also why a lot of times people are like, oh, it's a Bell's palsy. We also often see that in recovering Bell's palsy. Um, and so again, this is why we see a lot of these patients in the facial nerve center as well. Um, and it can get as bad where you can't even open your eyes. It's just this constant contraction. For the lower facial portion, the oral mandibular portion, a whole host of symptoms. And again, 
these are all based on the muscles that they're affecting, whether it's the facial um, expression muscles or the muscles of masti mastication. More commonly, as I said, muscles of mastication are involved. So trismus, difficulty in open the in the mouth, bruxism, which is just teeth grinding, spasms of the jaw, sideways or deviations of the jaw, where all of a sudden your teeth don't feel like they fit together, um, tight lip, um, I'm sorry, lip tightening or pursing. Um, you can have um, sort of like a scowl or a drawing back of the corners of the mouth, deviation and protrusions of the tongue, and we'll talk a little bit about why that's actually really difficult to treat, jaw pain, and then certainly all of this comes with difficulty in eating, drinking, and speaking, which then has a whole host of uh, social consequences as well. So for the, um, and this is just to show you a little bit about where these muscles are. For the, um, for the masseter, the temporalis, the medial pterygoid, and the latter pterygoids, which, which I already mentioned are the muscles of mastication, if you look where they are, they're all deeper muscles, especially the pterygoids, which are, if you, if you can imagine, go, you have to go right in the center of the, of the posterior pharynx to get to those. They all are within the sort of confines of the mandible. So to try to hit those with a needle becomes, as I said, it's, an, it's really an art and a skill. Um, the digastric, the geniohyoid, the myohyoid, these are all the lower muscles of the, of the floor of the mouth and the tongue. Again, these are all deeper muscles. They're not easy to palpate. They're not easy to find. And this is why treating this becomes a little bit of a, of a complex problem. Um, in addition to the muscles of mastication, again, you can have orofacial and muscles of facial expression. Generally, the ones that are most commonly involved are going to be the zygomaticus major, the zygomaticus minor, the abicularis um, oculi and oris, so around the mouth and around the eye, and then the buccinators, which are in the cheeks. Um, I mentioned the, um, the lingual or the, the tongue being involved. And again, when this is involved, it becomes a really difficult problem. Um, you can get severe tongue protrusion. You can get twisting and turning of the tongue, almost like a cramping of the tongue, which really inhibits um, speaking uh, as well as eating and communication. The tongue is just a big muscle. It's not just one muscle. It's multiple muscles. You can see here um, where you have the dorsal surface, but you have the styloglossius, the hyoglossius, the genoglossius. Those are all the tongue muscles. And figuring out which one's involved and possibly hitting it with, with a neuromodulator, very, very difficult, if not close to impossible to do. Um, but just to understand, when you have these lower facial dystonias, it really is about trying to figure out which muscles are involved and why so we can hopefully treat them and get, uh, and, and get uh, some kind of relief. So that's um, MAGE syndrome. Now we're going to just drop down a little bit lower into the neck. So this, that was all literally from the mandible from the jaw up. Now we're moving into the neck, the lower portion. So cervical dystonias, focal dystonia, again, same thing, inver involuntary activation of the muscles in the neck and shoulders, not the face. Um, this causes turning and tilting, flexion and extension of the head. And it can also be combined with even shoulder raising, shrugging, or twisting. Again, just like we talked about with the facial dystonias, it's pattern, it's repetitive, and it, and it leads to abnormal head position. So patients come in and their, their head is just either twisted or turned. Um, it's the most common focal uh, dystonia um, followed by blepharospasm. We're going to take, uh, so, uh, sorry, Dr. Billet. Neck is more important. I'm just saying, yeah, yeah. eye guy. Yeah. Um, along with the dystonias, um, head tremor is often part of the cervical dystonia complex. As a matter of fact, uh, anybody who comes in with an isolated head tremor, immediately, uh, I think, dystonia first. It's actually a dystonia until otherwise. If it's isolated, if it's an isolated head tremor, it's a dystonia until I can prove otherwise. If I can't prove otherwise, um, then uh, it's the correct diagnosis. And then, unfortunately, the other thing that, um, that, 
that probably all of you know too well is, is, is neck pain can be a big part of this. As a matter of fact, with all of these dystonias, that constant cramping uh, of the muscle can really become tender and uncomfortable on a constant basis and even with touch. The treatments vary. And I, I hate to say there's no great treatment. I wish there was a magic bullet that we could use, but there isn't. There's oral treatments, which I think have limited success. I think that what you're trying to do with these oral treatment is treat a local phenomenon, a local problem with a systemic answer, and it, it doesn't work very well. There's different medications. The medications that we use, whether it's clonazepam, the trihexylphenidyl, the diazepam, or the baclofen, um, all help with anxiety and muscle relaxation, which, uh, when we talk at the end of the talk, or when I, when, I, when I mention some of the things that I think help in the end of the talk, and why maybe medical marijuana works also is, I do believe that there is a contribution of stress management and anxiety in this. And I think that whether you're using these medicines or medical marijuana, that's what it's doing, which helps us because then we can maybe use stress reduction as part of the possible treatment. The gold standard first-line treatment for the, from the American Association of Neurology is going to be the botulinum toxin. We've been talking about that all day. Um, I'm not going to bore you guys with, again, how it works, but just know, right, it's always temporary. You inject the Botox into the muscle. The Botox then moves into the muscle and binds, right, with this SNAP25 protein on these vesicles. When it does that, it's, uh, and I think that they already talked about it, it's irreversibly bind, bound. Once the Botox attaches, it never releases. What happens, though, is the, 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 the actual um, vesicle, the, the nerve will go, wait a second, I don't think that's working, and it'll grow, grow new receptors. And when those new receptors grow, that's why the Botox eventually wears off. The bound receptors with the Botox are shed off with the botulinum toxin and a new receptor grows on and then the whole system starts working again. Um, but, so, so again, I don't wanna bore you with, with the, the intricacies of how Botox works. Once it's injected, um, it lasts for roughly about three months, right? So it's about a two to five day onset. It maximizes, and I tell patients, roughly between two and three weeks. So once we do the injection, it'll start to, you know, I always tell people, you're going to go home, nothing's going to change. Two to five days, you're going to start noticing whether it's the spasm in the eye, the lower face relaxing, the, the, the cringing in the, in the jaw will get better. Um, and then ma maximal effect is at two weeks. So at two to three weeks, we got what we got, and that's generally going to last roughly about two and a half months. So it's a two, because it's, it's, it's roughly lasts about three months. We got the two and a half uh, week onset or two week onset. We got a two week offset and we got that sort of two months of, of um, real good um, treatment for it. Everybody's different though. I have patients that I inject that will come back every four months and I have patients who come back every two months and it really becomes a very um, individualized treatment program. The treatment starts with a really good analysis. We have to know what muscles are being affected. You can't just say, well, I'm gonna put it into the general area. It doesn't work. You have to be very specific of what muscles we're targeting. So identifying the facial muscles involved, we do that by looking at the abnormal mo uh, movements um, and also um, palpation, right? I'll be able to feel the tenseness, the tension in the muscle, and also patients are usually able to say like, oh, they go, that's where it hurts. Um, so for the neck, it's a little bit easier because you can really see it. Is there an anterior flexion? Is there a posterior flexion? Is it lateral or is it a twisting motion? And based on what we see on the clinical exam is how we design the treatment. There's four different brands. Again, this is all stuff you probably heard before. Um, there's three that are Botox, a, I'm sorry, botulinum toxin A one that is a botulinum toxin B, and those are the Botox, the Xeomin, the Dysport, and the Myoblock. No difference. We've used all of them. There, I see in here that there's no difference. Patients have some preference sometimes, but I think that's just like, you know, I like this iced tea over that iced tea. 
still ACE-T. It's just, for whatever reason, some patient, patients feel like maybe the Xeomin or the Dysport might either work faster or last longer, but in overall studies, we see no difference. The thing that we do see is that at least 70% of the patients that we inject get some level of benefit, and that's pretty good. Um, as a surgeon, um, we don't like, I don't like to do, I shouldn't say we, I don't like to do things that I don't think are gonna work. I don't do surgery and go, well, maybe we'll see, I don't know. When you get up to 70% uh, success rate in some kind of relief, that's okay by me, and uh, that's why I really do like using Botox for this. Again, we talked about the time results, and um, as uh, uh, Dr. Berman um, talked about with uh, medical marijuana, uh, you can have some adverse effects. If you hit the wrong muscles, if the Botox diffuses into the wrong muscles, you can get some seri really serious consequences, whether that's with swallowing, with speech, or appearance. The way we inject it, um, so we fill the needle, the syringe with the Botox. Once we've identified the muscles that we want, we generally use an EMG, electromyogram. So basically, it's a little machine. I, Again, now hopefully it's, this isn't being redundant. Um, it basically helps us identify the muscle and the muscle activity. So when you put an EMG electrode into a muscle that's normal, when you move that muscle, if I put it into my shoulder and my shoulder wasn't moving, you wouldn't hear much. If I start moving the muscle, which indicates that there's activity in the muscle, there's going to be an electrical signal that goes, and you hear it as a little clicking. <laughs> When there's a muscle in contraction, abnormal or otherwise, if I'm doing it voluntarily, you hear it, it almost sounds like popcorn. It's like this, just da, 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 da. So you can really tell what muscles you're trying to target by using the EMG. For the deeper, mu deeper muscles, we also use ultrasound because it can really help us identify the belly of the muscle. And combined with the ultrasound and the EMG, we can get very exact on what muscles we're targeting. And then once we do that, there's all different charts on how much Botox to put into what muscle. And again, it really does become an individualized um, treatment plan. I have patients that I have to use in some muscles 50 units. And if I did that in another patient, they would you know, look like they had a stroke and wouldn't be moving for four months. And I have patients who I put in six units. And if I did that in another patient, they would have absolutely no result. So what we do is we have to, it takes a few times to really get the identified and perfect treatment for patients. But once we do, we get on a schedule. And again, the schedule could be somewhere anywhere between two and two and four months. And the patients come in and it's a very quick, um, it's a very quick visit because once we're in, once we're in our groove, you come in, you get it done and, and, uh, and then see in three, four months. Um, so that's the mainstay treatment for what, for what we do um, at Jefferson. We talked uh, a little bit about deep brain stimulation. I think that uh, this is, um, has tremendous potential. Um, we're not there yet. I think it's actually um, in the process of improving year after year. The more information, the more studies that are coming up. Um, as we talked about before, it's when an electrode is placed into the brain. Generally, it's placed into the globus uh, pallidus, the internal portion of the global, globus pallidus, which is part of that basal ganglia circuit. Um, and then we put the stimulator, which we talked about was that battery pack that sends a signal and does a direct stimulation. As I said before, I'm a big fan of you treat, you treat um, local or focal defects with focal treatments. When you try to do systemic stuff, I don't think it works as well. Um, and that's the only issue I have with maybe these, um, these transcranial stimulations because you're stimulating the whole brain, not just the area that really is going to be responding. So the, like I said, microelectrodes placed into the basal ganglia, you put the pulse generator on, and we're seeing some good results. And again, this is most important for patients that are really refractory to the, basal, um, to, to the botulinum toxin treatment and also for patients who you can't do the, the botulinum toxin, like I said, patients who have a lot of tongue uh, issues or contributions. Lastly, uh, I just wanted to talk about 
possible benefits of other things. Physical therapy, absolutely, 100%. We put everybody into physical therapy programs. It's not just uh, go to any general physical therapist, you know, down the street. We have, um, and, and I'll show you some of her information. We have a, a woman, Stacy, who is trained. All she does is facial nerve and sort of dystonia type of injuries. She is a head and neck physical therapist. She's an expert in, just like we are, on just the head and neck region. Speech and swallowing therapy, an absolute. Everybody also wants to know about some, some non-traditional therapies, whether it's acupuncture or uh, chiropractic. I absolutely send my patients to both because I think you have to try, right? I, I never had patients have a bad experience with it. I've had patients come back and be like, eh, I've tried it, I don't think. I've also had patients who really do notice a difference, mostly in the discomfort, maybe not in the contraction itself, but in the, in the discomfort. Stress reduction, uh, I talked about already. Um, believe it's a big portion of um, treating this. And then I think diet and exercise is also important. I don't think that if you're living an unhealthy lifestyle that's uh, high stress, um, you're gonna do as well as if you learn how to relax a little bit and uh, have a healthy lifestyle. Um, this is Stacy Bear's uh, information. And like I said, if you look at her, her, her CV, her resume on this, it really is all about head and neck stuff, whether it's the facial nerve, lymphedema, um, and uh, the, her services are part of our department and the Facial Nerve Center. So with that, uh, I am happy to take some questions. Uh, hopefully it was uh, informative and uh, somewhat enjoyable. All right, that was fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and we're gonna have a Q&A before the next session uh, so Dr. Klein can. So uh, does uh, taking uh, clonazepam a long time hurt you? Two, two pills a day. So uh, does it hurt you? Um, I'm not sure. I don't know if anybody knows. I think that there certainly are um, studies that say that as far as memory, um, long-term use with uh, clonazepam and things like Ambien and uh, either sleep or muscle relaxers and anxiolytics can affect memory, but I, don't, I think the jury's out on that. Um, I think that, again, stress reduction and anxiety is a, is a, is a part of this syndrome. Uh, and so I think that uh, if you need it and it's helping, I think that along with your primary care physician, you have to sort of weigh the uh, weigh and balance the uh, risk benefit ratio. Um, I've had cervical dystonia and take uh, strudo for my neck jerking. Have you had experience with this drug and have you seen many uh, side effects? So. Um, I'm a surgeon, and I, as I always say, I'm not as smart as uh, the general medical doctors and the neurologists and stuff like that. They really do a wonderful job of, of doing the medical aspect of this. So I don't have experience other, other than having patients who have been, sorry, patients who have been on it, um, but I don't manage it, so I don't really know um, the ins and outs and side effects that are affiliated or associated with it. Uh, I still do use Botox treatments, um, even on patients who are being treated, uh, whether it's with a Strudo or with any of the other uh, oral medications. But like I said, I think that the results um, are um, not as great as we would hope with the oral medications. And sometimes even if they are pretty good in the beginning, they start to wean um, over time. Uh, I have speech issues, uh, but something alone and take clonazepam only when needed when seeing p patients. Um, I fear for dementia exactly from it, um, but this is more or less dangerous as uh, taking it, uh, is it, is it the, as the same as taking it daily if you take it on a PRN and as needed basis. My understanding from the, from the clinical studies that it is not, that it's better to take it on a PRN as an ad, as needed basis than just as a routine, getting up every day and being like, there's my, there's my morning dose and there's my afternoon dose. For a lot of these medicines that are anxiolytics, um, again, I think that 
And, and I should have put in, in my others, um, even right, therapy, right? Um, whether it's with a psychologist or a psychiatrist, talking about stress reduction, meditation, yoga. There's so many different ways. And I know a lot of people go, ah, this is a medical condition, that's not gonna help. It really does make a difference. Um, I had one patient who was a, an executive, high stress, horrible symptoms. We were Botoxing him for probably five years. Um, and then he retired. And he and his wife, not that it, vacations went have it, they took a little bit of time. They took two weeks, went away. When they came back, they decided to do this whole meditation, mindfulness thing. And literally, um, I probably halved his Botox treatments over the course of the last two years just as he got rid of stress and sort of, um, sort of grounded himself. So I really do believe it, in it and think that it works. Um, I had blef, uh, blepharospasms for eight years and then got OMD. Um, should I expect a neck dystonia? Nobody knows. 